right. So as Chris said, I'm the developer of these tools, at least the main developer. Um, of course, I'm using a lot of the infrastructure that we have in Houdini, like the, all the great C++ operators and everything. And my job is mainly, um, it's pretty similar to what a TD would do in Houdini uh, in the places where you work. Um, basically building, st building everything that you can build uh, within Houdini, right? Using HDAs, VEX operators, and things like that. At least that used to be my uh, description. I used, I moved a little bit into C++ work, um, writing core operators as well. And um, that's actually one of the main things I did for Houdini 17, as you'll see. I'll talk a little bit about the performance improvements that we uh, implemented there. Um, so a little bit of the history uh, with these fur tools. So I've worked uh, for side effects uh, from Germany since uh, 2014 when I left uh, London. I used to work at DNEC before that for five years as an effects TD. Uh, and when I started uh, at side effects, there was a TD there, um, Scott Keating, who developed some interesting new techniques. We had a first system already and he developed some techniques, uh, some, some things that uh, allowed easier interactive grooming and he uh, so he's really good at experimenting and finding these new techniques, but um, he kind of handed that off to me to implement into the software. That's how I got start, got my start in fur and uh, hair. I didn't really have anything to do with that before that point, so I kind of just slipped uh, into this. Uh, and I, but I, I loved it right away, and I, I love working on it. And um, ever since then, we kind of kept developing these things. And in Houdini 16, as you might know, we implemented a completely new fur system. Which is um, which is uh, where you have these modular objects, the guide, groom, hair generate that you might know. Where before it was the kind of monolithic uh, thing where you did everything in one operator, um, and then since then, sixteen five was a big feature release as well. It didn't have a new first system because we we had that. We kept just developing that, but the number of features was probably there were probably as many new features in that as there were in sixteen, and now seventeen is kind of a release where uh, I didn't actually have that much time to work on first systems because I had other um, projects, but um, I had the time to really look at performance of some of the core operators, and that's uh, part of what I want to talk about today. So just an overview. So I have two parts. Uh, first, I'll go through these performance improvements, and I'll um, I want you to have a like, good understanding of what's going on there, um, because some. Uh, in, in part, it's really just, okay, it's faster, great, I'll work with that, but uh, there are some things that are good to know to make the most use of those things and ensure that you always get the best performance. Uh, and then I'll go through some grooming setups that just show, uh, show off some, um, yeah, just some interesting things around the first system that might not be that obvious. Um, the challenge here was to find things that I didn't talk about already in master classes, so I tried to find some um, well, probably not unusual things, but things that require um, a workflow that is not totally obvious uh, and that I, haven't, that I haven't shown yet. So, uh, Houdini 17. So basically the main thing we did was we took the most used operators, uh, like hair generate, hair clump, that you use basically in every groom scene, and um, I wanted to I knew that uh, one, what we had in Houdini 16 was kind of slower than some of the competition. Um, it was all implemented as HDAs, as I mentioned, uh, Houdini digital assets, and um, basically you every node contained a few dozen VEX wrangle nodes where everything was just developed in there, and um, I had a feeling that it could be a lot faster if it was C++. Um, so I started with a hair generate uh, SOP and just investigated a little bit, and it it was pretty simple at the start. It was just like a one-week project um, where it didn't do a lot of the stuff that it had to do, but it was obvious that it was gonna it was gonna be a lot faster. So we ended up uh, rewriting this list of operators, uh, and the guide mask um, stands out a little bit because um, it's kind of a very simple operator that you just use to mask off areas and define where your next operator is gonna work. It's a very simple thing. But uh, I found that in a lot of the scenes that I received from you guys, um, that when I ran a performance monitor on, on those, uh, 
those simple operators showed up quite a bit. So um, any improvement there was going to make a big uh, difference. Can I get some water? <laughs> um, let's test that in my notes here. <laughs> so um, guide process uh, is not a full conversion. There's own, it's made up of a lot of different parts, and I just didn't have the time to do it, but I uh, converted some of the uh, main operations that you use, like set length uh, to C++ as well. And it uses um, guide mask internally as well, so you get some performance gains from that as well. Um, now, you might ask yourself, um, if you know Houdini, you probably think of Vex as something that's pretty fast, and it's good for, it's really good for a lot of things, like when you work on um, volume data, anything that's like a big block of data, volumes, particle systems, fluids, any Vex operations on there. Even if you have a billion particles, there is a chance that you're just going to wait a few seconds for a computation. So it's usually fast enough. It's pr really good for those things. Um, but I was kind of surprised to find that grooming is kind of a special case where, uh, just due to the fact that you work on uh, points as well as curves, it sounds simple, but just jumping between those two contexts means you have to have uh, multiple wrangle operators to do almost anything. Um, for example, the hair clump swap uh, runs over curve primitives to find uh, the closest clump curve and things like that. And then you have to jump over to points uh, to set point positions, right? Um, and that kind of operation, you, you can uh, run a VEX uh, operator on primitives and write to point values, but that's really slow. Um, because uh, it's really easy to step on your own feet there. So we had a mechanism th in there that made everything single-threaded to be safe. So to ensure that um, when you multi-thread VEX, to make sure that um, multiple threads didn't write to the same point and things like that, we had some locks in place there that made everything really slow. Um, and then, actually, when we found this, uh, that this was a problem for these operators, Jeff Late implemented a kind of function in VEX that gets around that. It's kind of a, OK, I know what I'm doing function um, that is a lot faster. But uh, you still wouldn't get the full gain that I'm getting uh, with C++ here. And also geometry, creating geometry, um, a lot of it is kind of slow from VEX as well, because it's single-threaded. So um, the, the advantages we get over VEX, you get one core operator. So you, uh, you save all these little overheads that you get uh, when you have a lot of VEX operators, right? Everyone has a, every operator has a little bit of an overhead. And you, um, when you just have that one C++ operator, you save all those little bits. Uh, and the previous HDAs, as you can see here, contained dozens and dozens of nodes. And now it's just that one thing. Um, it's still, uh, the, the new operators are still digital assets. So you might be a little bit surprised. You might think, why is it not, why can I still jump inside? Why is it not just a locked off C++ thing? Uh, and there are two simple reasons for that. One was I wanted to be able to uh, still use some uh, general uh, SOPs in there. Like, uh, you can probably not read that here, but or maybe you can. Uh, the polyframe uh, SOP in there. I didn't want to have to rewrite that in C++ as well. So if by just making it a little HDA with a core C++ operator inside, I was able to reuse some SOPs. Um, and then the other reason is uh, it's actually not possible to write operators with multiple outputs in C++ yet, so that's why they're still digital assets. That really forced me to do it. Um, but some, there are some things that go beyond just that little VEX and C++ comparison where we get more gains. For example, the hair generate sub uh, can now reuse the geometry that it generates. So on the first cook, when you first open a scene, um, you're going to see that it takes a little bit longer to cook. Uh, not than before, but it takes longer than subsequent uh, cooks. Because it, of, of course, on the first cook, it has to generate everything. But then on the subsequent cooks, it can check how and what way the inputs changed. So for example, if only the position changed on guide curves, it can reuse the topology and everything that it generated before, all the curve data, 
because um, it no we know that uh, the number of curves and everything isn't going to change. So we just update the positions. Obviously, that's a huge speed gain, uh, performance gain. And uh, there's also sometimes that fails, for example, when um, with hair generate, you can import attributes, right? You can import any number of attributes from guides and uh, skin geometry. And when you remove an attribute from that list or an attribute disappears from the guides for some reason, um, I don't go through the work to delete that attribute from the cache geometry. I just throw it away and <coughs> regenerate. Sorry. And um, so it's not usually not a problem because that doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen when you play back an animation. Uh, but there's still a fallback uh, when that happens where we can still reuse the cached guide uh, indices so we don't have to do the expensive lookup again. So even then, it's a lot faster. Um, it's similar with the air clump SOP, like I mentioned before. The, uh, it has to do this lookup to find the closest guide to each curve. And uh, caching that information is really uh, valuable there as well. That's all stuff that you can't really easily do uh, in VEX. So you'll see a pretty noticeable speed up after the first cook, uh, which is, of course, especially important for interactively uh, tweaking things. Uh, you're not going to notice a speed up on the farm, apart from that 4x that you get uh, in general. But um, I find that in interactive sessions for the operators that we rewrote, so not across the whole uh, system because we didn't touch everything, but um, for the operators that we rewrote, it's going to be about 10 times as fast as Houdini 16.5. Can I actually get a show of hands? Like how many people are already using Houdini 17? Okay, that's pretty. That's better than I expected, actually. It takes a while uh, to transition. And how many of you are using uh, the first system in Houdini 17? Okay. <laughs> uh, kind of. I wrote my own. <laughs> OK, that's good. Um, so for those of you that aren't using 17 yet, hopefully that makes you want to use it. Um, so let's, um, sorry about the lack of pictures so far. Still not an exciting picture, but uh, let's, uh, let's look at a little bit more at what that does in practice. Like I said before, <coughs> if you, you don't really have to care about this, but it is useful in some situations. So I want to go a little bit into the mechanism that lets us um, know that we can keep this cache because there's a danger with caching anything that you're going to be out of date, right? Out of um, you're going <coughs> to generate something that doesn't correspond to your current input anymore. And the main mechanism we use for that is attribute uh, data IDs, which is in concept really simple. It's just um, number an integer ID that is associated with uh, every attribute on your geometry. And you see those little values um, when you, when you uh, can you actually see a cursor there? Yeah. So when you activate the debug uh, button on there, on the node info window, you get these IDs displayed next to the attributes. And I'm still going to say probably just don't do it. Once you go down that rabbit hole, you're going to look at it all the time. <laughs> um, probably ignore it. But you'll see. Um, you'll see that uh, when I play that animation, only the position attributes ID changes. And that's a really good thing because it means that the operators that computed up to that point only uh, touched the position attribute. And also they were good about um, indicating that. So all the modern operators that we have, some haven't been converted yet, but all the modern ones will um, only bump that ID for the attributes that they actually touch. And that lets subsequent operators like hair generate um, <coughs> know that know about that. So when the position only the position changes, we can do some smart things, like um, the neighbor lookup that hair generate computes. So finding the closest guides for each uh, point that you grow hair from, that's expensive, and that uses the rest and rest root attributes. So not the position directly, right? We need some space to define that lookup, but it's that rest attribute that doesn't change. And because the data ID of it also doesn't change, we know that any uh, lookup we computed before is still going to be valid. So we can keep that around and only react to that position change. 
and uh, topology works the same way. Um, the primitive list and the, um, the points associated with every primitive, that's all just stored as, uh, as attributes, so it works exactly the same way. So obviously that um, most of the time you'll only see the position change, but when you do something like uh, plant guide or something like that, which, which adds a guide, or you mirror your groom or something like that, those data IDs get bumped, and then the operators down the chain know they have to recompute something. Um, so I also want to talk what talk about what this is not. Um, it's really a very simple concept. Okay, it's not. Um, it doesn't tell us anything about where on the character something changed. It's not a localized change. So when you change a position on a on a character's ear, like a little guide there, uh, and the position changes, we have to reinterpolate the positions for the whole character. We don't yet have anything that tells us um, only this area changed. Or although for the first system, that would really make sense, and I'd like to have that. Um, and there are some additional caveats, although they're not usually a huge problem. Um, when you read file caches from disk, animated caches, so let's say a BGO sequence or a Lambic, usually all the data IDs will be changing on every frame. Um, it's usually not a problem for the first system because we get our um, our rest position and everything from a static rest pose. So as long as that is not uh, animated, you have to check that basically that you don't have a time dependency flag set on that, um, then it's all good. But there might be some operation, operations that you do outside of the fur tools and with internal operators, uh, C++ operators at your uh, studio that could benefit from fixing that. And you can fix it just with a time shift just like you would do to copy a rest, um, generate a rest position. Uh, you use a time shift on the animated cache and then copy over any attributes that you know to be animated. And then you get static data IDs for the ones that don't, that aren't. Um, and just to be aware that some, you might use some operators in your groom that are not aware of these data IDs yet. Um, so it's, Things are not going to fall apart. It's not going to break anything, but you're going to lose that performance. If any operator, um, if you have any operator like that in your chain, all your data IDs will change all the time, and you throw away all those performance gains. And that might especially be true of some older operators that you have around. So uh, you might want to bug your R&D departments if you have one <laughs> about that. Um, yeah, and if you find an a built-in operator that you think would be great to update, just let us know. Because we have a list of things we can't get to everything at once. So if you want us to bump one, then uh, yeah, just let us know. And here, um, just uh, seeing some more of the effect of that in practice. Uh, at the beginning there, I was scrubbing uh, this animation and it was like uh, running at 10 frames per second. And then I do kind of the worst thing you can do is uh, delete the rest attribute on there. So I deleted that on the skin as well as the guides. And uh, that emits this warning on the hair generate where it says, uh, I don't have a rest position. I'm computing everything based on just the position attribute. Of course, that breaks various things as well. So it's not something you would usually do. But you'll also see when I scrub there, that cuts my frame rate uh, in half or even less than that. It's usually like a 2.5x increase in time. So uh, that was a lot of detail, but basically the main takeaway is uh, make sure you keep your rest attribute around and manage that properly. And it's also important to, I know a lot of you are um, using the Houdini fur tools just for part of the pipeline, right? So you might be creating guides in another package or creating them yourself using general sub tools. Just make sure that you add all these attributes on there so everything works properly. <coughs> and here's just uh, some more detail about that. Play. So here I'm just increasing the guide count, uh, the hair count a little bit. Let's restart that. So you also see when I scrub the slider there with the width attribute, that's super fast to update. 
because we're caching the geometry. It doesn't have to, it's all computed in one operator, but it's not recomputing all the hair interpolation and everything. And when I bump, um, bump that up to like a production count, so I think we have like three million hairs or something like that here. Um, it takes about three seconds now, where before it would have taken, I don't know, well over 10, 20 seconds. And you'll see, I'll play back the animation here. Obviously, we're still running on the GPU. It's not gonna, uh, on the CPU. It's not going to be uh, real time, but it takes like three seconds for that. So that's also the time it would take to generate on the farm. And uh, you'll see when I uh, display that hair clump below, it takes a little bit to compute, but it's only like one or two seconds. And then when you play it back, it's uh, just a fraction of a second. It doesn't add much to the overall computation time. All right. So I was thinking, I was going to talk to you about that before, Chris. Um, <laughs> I have it split into kind of two completely separate parts. So now I'm going to talk about some grooming features and things like that. Do we want to do a little Q&A now? Or I don't know if there are going to be any questions about this technical stuff. But since I'm going to talk 20 minutes about something completely different, you might forget your question. So. Yep. Oh, just hold on there. Let I think just you're going to get, get a mic. mic. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, one question. All these attribute ID um, features that allow nodes not to be cached or not to cache certain attributes if they don't change, do they also apply to non fur operators? Absolutely. I mean, so could you give an example? Cheers. It applies to everything in SOPS. It applies to everything in SOPS, but um, in the fur operators, there are some really good opportunities to use that information really well. But it also applies to um, Vellum, for example. Right, so uh, I know Vellum manages the data IDs really well. Actually, DOPS was really good at it for a long time already, but it's been brought over to SOPS. So if you simulate something in Vellum, it's also going to just output position changes and orientation changes, and all the other two dozen attributes that you get will be constant data IDs. Um, and I couldn't tell you, um, I'd have to find an example of an operator that where you get really big gains right now. Um, I'm not sure. But actually, one thing I wanted to mention, I just remembered, um, you also get gains just displaying things in the viewport. Because, uh, for example, if you have a color attribute on there and it has a constant data ID, it's not going to be sent to the graphics card in every frame. Uh, that's a really big one, actually. Another over there. Maybe, Paula, do you want to? Thanks. Sorry, I've got two questions. Um, yep. First one is, uh, you mentioned that um, lots of the, oh, some uh, adding uh, geometry in Wrangles is, multi is single threaded and certain other things are single threaded. Yep. Is that in, listed in the docs somewhere I can look up to find out what is and what isn't single threaded so I can be more efficient? Um, I'm not sure this is mentioned in the docs. I, I would hope it is. Um, but I don't think there's going to be a long list of these things. It's, it's, I think it's pretty much isolated to that because it's a kind of a special case in the code. And I don't think there's much else there. But it's uh, the way you can think of adding geometry in VEX is sometimes you have to do a little bit of work to compute, like where your points will be added and things like that. Right? That could be expensive as well. That's going to be multi-threaded. But then whenever you make a call like add point, add primitive, that's going to be queued up and computed by a single thread at the end. So the, um, you also mentioned there's a an I know what I'm doing um, mode. Right. How do you use that? So I just thought of mentioning that up here. <laughs> I don't recall what the function is named. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll email you after. I'll, 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 so, sorry about that. I know that's an interesting one, but uh, that, you, you tantalize us with these tip bits and then keep them away from us. Um, you, sorry, that was question. That I was need you to come back. Question so. 1.5. Um, yeah. My other question is the uh, data IDs. Yeah. Is that just something internal for um, uh, C++ compiled uh, nodes or can you access them in Wrangles and use them to your own ends? Uh, you can access them 
from Python as well, I think. Okay, great. Um, but the the amount of stuff you can do with that is kind of limited still because when when you know when you when you find that and you you can probably even cache the old value and compare it and find out when something's changed, but uh, in Vex it's pretty limited what you can actually do with that information. Yeah. Um, that, oh, thanks. But uh, there are plans to. Well, there are plans, there are ideas <laughs> to change that as well. Yeah, so we'll it'll probably spread out. So it's going to be something that like TDs and R&D departments and things will use, will be able to use to good advantage within Houdini as well, I think. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Maybe one more question before we move on. Uh, so I had two questions. The first was already answered because I was going to ask what's the function that Jeff Lee made because right. <laughs> I do a lot of setting Sorry. things down from, from the primitive to point. Yeah. Um, the second one uh, relates to what was mentioned. There is like uh, before I I did I tried to to grasp because sometimes when you're changing things in geometry for inspection for debugging, you want to know what changed and. Yeah. have a visual say oh, okay this point here is a different value so those ids could help in that um in that task yeah i think so okay um, it's but it's going to be it's not going to be 100 percent, but it's mm -hmm. um when something changes you will know okay but sometimes it will seem like more ch changed than what actually changed if oh, you okay. have an operator that bumps everything like i said right like mm -hmm. uh, an old operator it will seem like everything changed but it, it didn't so it's uh, e okay. the safest way still to look at the values. Okay. Okay. I'll so keep doing it. You want to open your <laughs> geometry spreadsheet as well. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. And just again to explain how that the data IDs work, don't uh, you're gonna see those all those crazy values like four hundred thousand something. Don't care about the value, right? Just when something changes, but you can you can figure that out when you play something back and watch the uh, node info window update. It's not. Yeah. It's kind of a user facing feature, but not really. Fair enough. But you can, there can be situations where it's useful. All right, thanks. So we'll uh, move on and we'll do another Q&A in about 20 minutes. Yep. All right, so there's actually one small feature that I can actually show. Uh, like I said, it's mostly performance updates, but um, there's there's been a few things where uh, people reported things on the alpha forum and I thought, okay, I can do this in with just a little bit of time on the site while I work on this the project that I'm supposed to be working on. Uh, one of those is uh, subclumping. It probably sounds like something that we had already. It's, it's actually true. It's, it's kind of just a small tweak to the behavior. I think it gets us closer to what people would expect out of uh, hair clump. So say you have um, some clumping already, like I have here, and then you want to add another level of clumping. And uh, we have two ways of doing that. We have the fractal clumping built in, but a lot of times people want to use another operator just because it gives you more control uh, and you'll uh, you'll see this new toggle on there the only clump within existing clumps and what that basically does is it ensures that clumps will not um, like when they split they will not move over to that other bigger clump they will split just um, they will just subdivide the uh, existing clumps so it just uses the clump ID that the first one outputs and limits to that. So when I blend here, you'll see um, that subtle change that you would expect, probably. Um, and it also, see how fast that updated? <laughs> um, if you're coming from 16.5, it's probably shockingly fast. But I don't, I don't know how we compare it to other softwares. But I think we're pretty. We're Pretty good now. So um, you'll also find some other small features, like um, there's some tweaks to the grooming, uh, the screen brush tool, and things like that. Uh, it's all based on your feedback. So keep it coming, please. That's really important to uh, developing the tools further at this stage, right? Uh, so we'll get into some uh, setups. Um, I wanted to show eyelashes because it's kind of uh, an unusual bit because you can't just like um, a lot of you probably know how to do it but um, it's not something that you use do using the standard workflow where you just grab your character and draw on some stuff or grow some hair from it 
So the way I do it is I um, use the curve sub, the good old uh, curve sub, um, to just point snap a curve to the to the mesh, and then uh, you can actually um, grow hair directly from a curve, which I think wasn't possible with the old first system. The one thing you need is uh, normals, so I just grab them using a raise up from the closest position on the mesh. And I'm just verifying that here, so I'm grabbing, I've got the normals from the eyelids. And then you can just run a create guides sub, uh, create guides shelf tool, and that will give you some guides. And then uh, you usually want those to be kind of evenly spaced. That's kind of what eyelashes do, I think. But uh, So I just switch that over to per point and then use a resample uh, to give me the number of points that I want. A pretty simple workflow there. And then uh, maybe an interesting detail about the resample uh, SOP. So I switched that to treat uh, polygons as subdivisions. And the subdivision algorithm that it uses there is not actually, uh, it's not NURBS or anything. It's We actually wrote, uh, I think like one and a half or two versions ago, we wrote a subdivision algorithm for curves that I think was new that just matches uh, the mesh subdivision perfectly. So you get the exa exactly the same curve there. All right, and then uh, just some more tweaking there. I think I'll skip over a little bit there so we have more time for our questions. And I want to show um, how you uh, how you deform that as well. So for the deformation, I'm just going to create a new object where I uh, keep my animated curve and uh, just merge in the static eyelid and the static uh, skin geometry as well as the animated one. And I'm just using a point deform. And the key thing here is to deform. Use You can use any number of tools for that, really. But the key thing is to deform the normal as well. That's what's going to drive the deformation of the curves. And here, I think I, it's doing something a little bit crazy. I think I, I forgot to uh, switch on the transform into this object on the object merge. I don't know if you ever do that. I do that. <laughs> um, and then you have your animated. Uh, base curve and then just a guide deform will move the eyelids there. By the way, I ran into that crazy uh, test animation just by... Uh, the pig is a vellum soft body as well. Let's look at that. Oh, here I'm just moving the eyelids a little bit, uh, the eyelashes a little bit into the geometry because there's some offset. I went for the simple fix and just did a transform. Yeah, so I ran into this crazy uh, test animation just by putting an attrib attribute noise as uh, initial velocity, and it ended up doing these kind of crazy things. So I want to show the vellum setup a little bit as well, moving a little bit outside of the fur tools. But I thought that was interesting as well. So it's really just um, standard. Uh, vellum soft body shelf tool, but I had to uh, actually glue the eyes into the character <laughs> because otherwise they were bouncing around inside the character, which didn't look that nice. Sometimes you might want that, I don't know. Um, but yeah, just a vellum glue constraint, you could do that any number of ways, but um, it's so stable, it works. So nice thing with vellum is, I find, is you use all these operators that sound like they should be doing what they're doing, and they do. <laughs> It kind of works stable and nice, and um, just that low frequency uh, variation and velocity that you saw there gave me this. Yeah, so just some wedges, some wedges on that. Um, all right. Next little setup. So I, I picked this one because I wanted to show something that uses um, that does something for long hair. Uh, I know a common kind of criticism of our tools is we don't have anything very specific to long hair, and it's it's true. I know it's an area that we need to work on. 
Uh, I just wanted to show something that uses general sub tools kind of outside of the fur tool set to do it anyway. So yeah, I'm just copying some curves, uh, bending them, twisting them into a, yeah, into a ponytail. And um, then I'm using a hair generate to generate curves around those three base curves. And then that uh, taper at the end is actually um, created just using built-in hair gen techniques. I don't know if you know this. Um, you can create this tightness uh, attribute on guide curves. And here I'm just using this really common expression to get a mapping from the root um, where it's zero to the tip where it's one. And it's just, it's just a linear progression. It uses, it's using that vertex prim index uh, expression, which gives you uh, just the index of the vertex within the primitive. So just zero to one, two, three, whatever the number of vertices is. And then dividing that by num VTX, which is the number of uh, vertices in the primitive overall, gives you a zero to one mapping a scalar. Um, and then the way hair generate picks that up is when that is at one, um, at the tip, the hair just collapses onto the guide curve. And in this case, each hair is only influenced by a single guide curve. So, um, so it's just collapsing onto that point. If you had multiple guide curves and they were blending in between, then you would see that moving towards that area around the tips of all those curves, it can be really useful. It's just, uh, I like to show things that, uh, where you kind of mix wrangles and things with the built-in uh, fur tools because that's how I find you kind of have to work with these tools to get the most out of them. Uh, Here's just randomizing the length a little bit. So I'll also show you how you, how you would set something like that up with uh, Vellum to simulate it. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the one thing I wanted to show here was how you uh, set up the constraints so that multiple ponytails that are close to one another won't stick together. And the key thing there is to uh, have a some sort of cluster attribute. I call it clump ID again, and because I'm just using a simple method to create multiple ones here. I just use a copy sop. I put a clump ID into the copy number attribute so that each copy will have a different ID. You see here some have value one and some have uh, value zero. And then when I jump over to the simulation network, um, you just have to basically plug that into the glue constraint. So this, the top one is just standard uh, hair constraints. And then I added a glue which is actually what the guide simulate object uses for to create clump constraints. And here you just plug um, clump ID into the uh, cluster attribute to avoid these kind of interconnections between the things. So if you left that, the, the things would just move together, right? They would stick together. And using a cluster ID, you can avoid that completely. So you get the nice uh, separate motion. And also you get, uh, by using those uh, separate uh, operators to create constraints, you get uh, you get to set the um, uh, constraint stiffness and things like that for everything separately. Um, yeah, and again, what I really like about Vellum, um, it kind of just works out of the box, and you don't spend that much time tweaking to just get it to do anything. And here, um, so I'm going to use, has not, this has nothing to do with the ponytails really anymore, but I'm just using it to show some other things. Um, I want to show how you can uh, take some other objects. I just used some spheres here and attach them to the hair. Um, so the first way I'll do it is I'll actually put them into the simulation as well. Uh, you don't necess necessarily have to do that depending on what you need. Um, but this is uh, just using a glue constraint again. Um, so the top two constraints are still my hair constraints. Then these uh, two are the ones you get out of the uh, vellum soft body shelf tool. So just the cloth constraint, which kind of creates uh, constraints on the surface. And then the struts, which run inside the objects uh, to create uh, yeah, some springs that basically keep the volume intact. And then you have another operator down there that does the glue in between uh, the spheres and the hair. So again, you get nice separate control over everything, 
with a very simple setup, you can control um, how the hair behaves. Then you set up basically the squishiness or whatever of the spheres. And then you have separate control over how well, how closely the spheres stick to the hair. Let's just see how that, what that looks like. So um, you may have noticed uh, there were some problems with the simulation. When I play that back, you see some spheres going dark. That means that their normals have flipped. So they've kind of gone like from this sh shape to they've gone like this, uh, one surface through the other. Uh, that's something you can, it's very close to vellum defaults here. You can fix that by making the constraints stiffer going higher stop steps and things like that. I just want to mention that. Um, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take all those uh, simulated spheres and just extract a transform. I'm going to basically uh, leave, the sh leave the spheres in their rigid shape, but use the deforming uh, animation to drive that. So extract transform gives you a point for every sphere. And then you can use the transform pieces to you, you can, you can uh, take those points and transform the input geometry so you just get the rigid spheres. And that's what I'm playing back here. I, it happens to also fix that normal flipping issue, which is great. And then, uh, oh, wow, okay. I'll be okay. <laughs> I'm running out of time. Um, but I did a little bit of the Q&A early. <laughs> oh, you calculated that, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I, it fixes that issue. And um, a lot of the times, you don't really care about things deforming. In this case, I showed like the templated deformed geometry on top of the rigid one. It was so close, it didn't really make a difference. Uh, it's just a nice technique to know about. And oh, I skipped one there. And then another technique, I think, uh, I mean, I'm not actually sure. I think this is kind of a, it's keep, it keeps jumping. I think this kind of this kind of a little known feature of guide deform. Usually guide deform is used to deform guides, guide curves with the skin geometry, but you can also use uh, guide curves to deform something else. So in this case, the first input is actually the spheres. I want to deform those. And then you give it the rest guides and the animated guides, and the spheres will move with those guides. And um, it, so that, uh, Obviously, that way uh, it's going to be faster to simulate because you're not, not putting the spheres into the simulation. You're just doing it after the fact. And of course, um, it has that. It has a toggle on there to give you a rigid transform as well. So that's built in. So I'm turning that on there. You kind of saw saw the spheres squishing there with the deformation. Now they're staying rigid. Uh, I found when I recorded this that that one doesn't fix the flip normals. So I think I can fix that. <laughs> I'll try. I should just use the same code as the extract transform. So it'll do that as well in the future. Um, yeah, I think it's a really nice workflow. And um, another advantage is if your input um, geometry is packed primitives, which it often is in your pipeline, I guess, then it'll transform that the same way. So that makes it really efficient as well. So you can, whatever stuff, rigid stuff you attached into your fur, uh, that's a really nice way to do it. So now I'm thinking, hopefully I'll get through everything. Um, here's just um, another setup with custom clump IDs. That's um, manipulating clump IDs before you go into hair generate. So I, uh, I'm creating some noisy kind of clump ID values using attrib noise. I'm going to visualize that here. Um, I just found that I had to, or I think, did we see that? It should be colored here. Yeah, that's the noisy values. Uh, I just had to fix the values out of attrib noise a little bit um, because you can only run it on points uh, and you can only generate uh, float values, so I have to attrib cast that to integer values and then promote to primitive. But then you can use those output values as a clump ID. And you'll see what that does. It basically gives you these islands where in between the hairs split to 
kind of uh, shift towards uh, the clump curves that they belong to. And it's again, the way that transition happens, that shift is again controlled by the tightness attribute. All right. So last one, uh, using clump data in a different way. That's kind of the opposite, or well, after what I just showed. So you have uh, you have some clumps already, and I wanted this effect where I can do some additional editing on top of the clumps. In this case, I wanted to yeah create these kind of mushrooms where they bend out from the clump center. Uh, you can kind of fake that by just changing the clump profile, but um, not to the same extent. So what I did, uh, I basically needed needed to compute a, um, I, I, I knew I could use the guide process bend, but I needed to compute the direction. So I'm using hair clump, uh, the feature on there that lets you copy attributes from the guide curves. And I just copied my position into a clump position attribute, copy that over. And then a wrangle after the hair clump lets me compute that direction. So just um, P minus clump position. They're kind of facing down like a Christmas tree because the hairs, when they move towards the clump, they kind of they not they don't reach to the last vertex, right? They uh, they're below a little bit, but it doesn't matter. Guide process the bend operation will deal with that, and you just need a general direction, and then you can bend it outwards. So you are just bend it by 180 degrees, so they bend over backwards. And then I'm trying to get smaller curves, and I found that I had to up the segment count a little bit to get those fine details. Yeah, I just thought that was a nice way of using just some of the output data that you can get out of hair clump. And we'll try, I'll try to quickly simulate that as well. For that, um, I'm going to make the curls a little bit bigger so we can see a little bit more of that. jump ahead a little bit. Yeah, I deleted some of the curves just to get quick feedback. And then um, this is just complete defaults. So let's see what that looks like. Um, they they kind of fall apart, which you would expect. Uh, yeah, the first thing I have to do is enable the clump constraints. And that because everything has clump IDs output by the clump operator, um, they then stick together better. But I found that the defaults didn't work that well here. And I um, I actually found that I have to expose probably some more parameters from the nodes that I use inside. But um, you don't need to wait for that. You can fix that uh, yourself using standard tools. Uh, here I create an external simulation network uh, just using the button on the guide simulate. Uh, and that gives you this sub network. So whenever you use Vellum, which is the default now, you get that sub network where you have the three um, inputs that are standard with Vellum. So you can insert any operator yourself. But I also find it useful to just expect, uh, inspect what uh, Vellum outputs. So here, it's an easy way to look at the constraints that are actually generated. And I found when I re-enable re the clump uh, constraints on the top node, you see that they, uh, you see these ladder shapes there? They uh, just end up constraining pairs of curves together, but not the whole bunch. So I had to use, um, I just, disabled that again and created a custom, well, not a custom, but my own vellum glue uh, node in there, which does the same thing, but it has full access to all these uh, parameters. And I found that I had to just increase the number of constraints you get per point. Otherwise, the points that are close to one another would just find each other. So you need it. Um, so I needed that. And then it sticks together a lot better. Then if you want it to be stiffer, then it's just uh, raising the constraint stiffness, and then it worked properly. Okay. Yep, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I think we've got time for about two questions, and then we'll have to move on. Uh, Kai will be here all day, so you can grab him later at lunch or whatever. Any questions? In the middle here? Hello? Yep. Hey, 
Um, I was just wondering, you said you can use the guide deform to deform any sort of geometry. Right. Is that faster than using like point deform or cloth deform then? Uh, no, but it's a little bit specialized to curves. Okay, it's using so it's a similar technique, but it's, it might give you better results. Uh, okay. There can also be simulations where point deform is nicer. But it's a different algorithm. Okay, thank you. Tony, maybe you can throw it back to yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've just got a very general question. Um, I've noticed when initializing a, a first system, there's lots of um, default values entered into the VDB density and right. um, scatter count. Does that suggest any sort of uh, uh, useful working scale for a groom, or should it be fully scale independent? Uh, it tries to. Okay. But uh, we actually compute that based on the scale of your model. So and it's, so and it's would not all the tools follow through? Or is it is, is there a recommendation of a certain size? Well, for uh, world scale, or I think uh, the VDB uh, voxel size is computed based on the average primitive area. So when you have tiny polygons, it's going to generate tiny voxels. So that kind of assumes that there's detail in the model that you want to represent mm -hmm. at that scale. But it could be that you have a very smooth model that you have just subdivided with three levels, which is common. Then that would fail, and you might get away with something much lower okay. or higher, greater voxel size. So it's uh, I wouldn't trust it 100 percent, but it tries to suggest something. Yeah, but so working at non-world units would be fine. Oh, you mean the I general don't. character scale? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's totally fine. Yeah, right. cool. Thanks. There are some caveats, but in general, yeah. Good. Thanks, Kai. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.